Well, let me begin by saying thank you, Julie. Um, of course, to Dr. Boyenton, who organized this entire forum. Also to Dr. Moon, who will be my respondent for today's talk. Um, especially to all the volunteers who have made this entire forum possible. There are more of them than you would believe. Um, and they've all put a great deal of work into this. And especially this morning to our lovely singers, the two Michaels, Ubo and Tara. That was an absolutely wonderful rendition of John Lennon's Imagine. And I have no doubt that if he were with us still, he would be utterly thrilled to hear his song sung in a bilingual Chinese English version. That is something truly new and wonderful. Uh, if you do have questions, may I suggest that you do uh, send them to the chat because in all honesty, I am not going to talk for 50 minutes. And so there should be plenty of time today for us to take questions from the audience. So without further ado, let me begin. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good morning. We live in difficult times. The problems facing humanity have never been greater. Global warming threatens to create a world in which human life will be hostile, which will be hostile to human life. Air pollution has made it hazardous to breathe in many of our cities. Enormous disparities of wealth between individuals and between countries have doomed billions to substandard lives and have prevented the world from benefiting from the talents, the insight, and the compassion of many of its people. Violence and hatred are destroying lives, societies, families, and a toxic racism percolates through our society, poisoning everything we hold dear. This was a situation facing the world at the end of 2019. And then along came COVID-19 and made it worse. COVID-19 presented us with a problem that can only be solved by coordinated global action. It challenged us to respond to a global crisis as a globe. We failed to rise to that challenge. Instead, we fell back on the tired cliches of the nation state, us versus them, scapegoating, self-interest, suspicion, xenophobia. As a result of our failure, a problem which could have been contained and rapidly dealt with has become a global catastrophe. We live in difficult times. It is a sign of the desperation of these times that so many people believe the world is ending. They come from many different points of view. Some decry it, some applaud it. Some have used this belief to call for resistance and vigilance. Others have used this belief to call for estrangement and intolerance, hatred and cruelty, even violence. Whatever the differences, they are all convinced that the world is coming to an end. They are correct. Let me repeat that. The world as we have known it is ending and there is nothing any of us can do to stop it. The forces that are driving this process were set in motion long ago and are now too powerful to be turned aside. The sky is indeed falling. But what I and my chicken, fellow chicken littles often forget is that endings are also beginnings. Yes, the world is ending, but no, that's not the end of the world. New world, it is instead the beginning of the new one. New worlds, however, must be built. They don't appear on their own. Ours is the pain of watching as much as we hold dear falls apart around us or is destroyed. We feel that sorrow in small ways as places and people dear to us disappear and in large ones as our way of life is changed irrevocably. 
our pain is real and our sorrow is justified, but we still have cause for joy and hope. Because along with the misfortune of watching one world die, we also have the honor of helping a new one to be born. What world will we create? What world will we choose to live in? How do you build a new world? Well, to start with, you need to know what you're trying to build. You need a blueprint. Worlds, like houses, come in many shapes and sizes. You can build a Victorian mansion, an Art Deco skyscraper, or a Chinese retreat in the woods. We can build a world dominated by the rich and the corporations, a world ruled by force and the threat of force, a world governed by justice, a world founded on peace, a world where everyone can flourish. The possibilities are literally endless. It is only through our imagination that we can begin to conceive of what these possibilities are and explore them. It is through imagination that we can begin to conceive of a new tomorrow different from today. Moreover, imagination can help us see the possible goals we can strive for. It helps us to find methods to accomplish these goals. How do you achieve justice and unity? Can you build a just world through unjust actions? Can you build a unified world by dividing people? Do the ends justify the means? Or are the means and the ends the same thing viewed from different points of view? It is through imagination that we find both our goals and our methods. Without it, without imagination, we're driving a car without a map or a steering wheel. All we have is a gas pedal. Maxine Green, the great philosopher of education from Columbia Teachers College, examined the importance of imagination in great depth. She stressed the need for imagination to open a space in which it is possible to conceive of a better state of things. And she emphasized the importance of art and literature for education, recognizing that all of us, but especially the young, need the experience of exploring alternate worlds the imagination can create. Only through that experience can we begin to imagine alternate worlds of our own. And only by imagining alternate worlds can we hope to begin changing this one. Unfortunately, we have become a society that has little use for the imagination. In the publishing industry, there is now more demand for nonfiction than fiction. And a work of fiction that claims to be based on a true story will sell better than one that admits that it was made up. On TV, reality TV shows remain the rage, in spite of the fact that everyone admits they're the entertainment equivalent of a Twinkie laced with cyanide. In our schools, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and medicine are experiencing a renaissance, but art and literature are increasingly seen as frivolous. Our fondness for facts is so great that we would rather consume an ugly, demoralizing, misleading, even false fact than a beautiful, uplifting, enlightening, and true fiction. In this year of pandemic, this bias has grown even more pronounced. Even among scholars of the humanities, there have been calls to abandon art and literature. For what use are they when the world is facing an existential crisis? I will argue today that not only are they useful, they are essential to our continued survival, but we have become clumsy in their use. We have convinced ourselves that the creations of the imagination have no relevance to our reality. And for that reason, we have forgotten how to use them well. Let me give you one example of how the imagination can be uh, helpful to us in our daily lives. I'm certain that every person listening to this talk has had this experience. Let's imagine, while you're going about your day, someone does something, did something that you didn't like. 
perhaps I said something unkind to you. Perhaps I cut in line or stole your parking space. Perhaps your boss yelled at you for no good reason. You got angry. Later on, whenever you think about the incident, you get angry again. You think to yourself, the next time that happens, I'm going to give that person a piece of my mind. I'm going to say, and you think of all the nasty things you want to say to that person. Maybe you even imagine yourself hitting them and it feels good. We've all done this. Often, we repeat our imagined payback over and over in our minds. But when we imagine ourselves responding to a problem with anger or violence, we are training ourselves to respond to future problems in that way. We are making it more likely that when confronted by problems in the future, we will respond with anger and violence. On the other hand, if we imagine ourselves responding to a problem by staying calm and finding a peaceful solution, we are training ourselves to remain calm and rational when faced with difficulties, and we are increasing the likelihood that we will do so in the future when faced with problems. This is a simple but shockingly effective method of training ourselves to respond to difficulties in a more humane, human way. But many of the problems facing us today, global warming, extreme inequalities of wealth and poverty, racism, and many others, are social or even global problems of immense complexity. Changing ourselves as individuals is necessary and important, but it is not enough. We must learn to apply our imagination to larger, more complex problems, and that will demand that we use our imagination in more sophisticated ways than we have ever before. And on top of that, we must learn to use our imagination collectively as communities, as societies, as a world. This is far more difficult. Fortunately for us, the first problem, how to use the imagination in a sophisticated way has already been addressed. So let's begin there. Art in all of its forms is an extraordinary, an extraordinarily sophisticated work of the imagination. Crafting even the most realistic forms of art involves a creative interaction between artists and the world around them. If we want to learn how to use our imagination with sophistic, in, with, in a more sophisticated way, art is really the place to begin. Hannah Arendt, a very influential philosopher of uh, government and morality from the 20th century, like Maxine Green, who she actually inspired, was very concerned with the, uh, with the problem of the imagination, with how it should be used. She held that imagination was necessary in political and social decision-making and in the quest for a better world. Arendt had lived through uh, World War II. Her family had fled Germany when the Nazis took over, so she knew something about how things could go wrong. Um, she had experience in what could go badly in society. She made the interesting observation that while imagination was an essential element of any kind of social or political decision-making, that it could be dangerous. And she proposed that a limit of some sort was necessary to keep the imagination from becoming harmful. Her proposal was that our imagination particularly when used as a social imagination, imagining what can be in our societies, should never stray too far from the actual situation we live in as it factually is. I accept Arendt's warning about the potential dangers of imagination. Any tool that is, can be used for good can also be used for evil. That's a basic rule. However, I think that her concept of a limit or a boundary over which imagination must not cross is too limiting. And more importantly, it doesn't actually match the way that artists work. Instead, I want to propose the concept of discipline. The imagination does not need a limit, but it does need discipline. Art is actually an extraordinarily disciplined activity. 
the notion often seen that art is freewheeling and without any sort of cares is, as we're going to see in a moment, incorrect. Artists are extremely disciplined and demanding of themselves. And so, rather than prescribe what the imagination should and shouldn't do on the basis of some theoretical argument, I suggest that we look at how artists discipline their own creativity in order to produce powerful and sophisticated works of the imagination. Let's learn from them how we then need to discipline our own imaginations. For the uh, purpose of this exploration, I'm going to use novels as an example. Novels are actually a particularly good and, uh, you know, example in this situation because there's a long history of novels being used as vehicles for social change. In the US, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852, galvanized anti-slavery sentiment in the US. Abraham Lincoln is said to have addressed Stowe as the woman who started the Civil War. In England, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness which was written by him as essentially a protest of the inhuman conditions of the Belgian Congo, served similarly to mobilize English public opinion against what was happening there. One of the organizers of the international movement that strove to change conditions in the Belgian Congo later referred to Heart of Darkness as the most powerful thing ever written on the subject. And in China, the modern novel itself grew and developed in a context of calls for reform and revolution. The explicit goal of writers, in the words of Liang Qichao, was to renew people's hearts and characters. Isn't that what we're looking for today? Isn't that what we want? So let's begin by asking ourselves, what are the qualities of a novel? What does it demand of the imagination? How do these novels then work so sophisticatedly with the imagination? Well, one of the most key and fundamental qualities of the modern novel is emotional realism. Even the most fantastic science fiction and fantasy novels must, if they hope to be good novels, portray the feeling of their characters in a believable way. And the actions that flow from those feelings must likewise be natural and real. A talking badger may take offense more readily than any normal human would, but his anger must still feel real to the reader and the actions that badger takes must still makes sense in light of his anger. He cannot, in a fit of rage, sit down to tea and cakes with a person who made him angry. If he did so, no one would believe it. The story would fail. The emotional realism of novels forces both the author and the readers to imagine their way into the heart and head of another person. This leads us to what I think is the first necessary excellence or virtue for sophisticated use of the imagination, and that is care. The imagination is not the same thing as whimsy. Whimsy implies carelessness, something created on a whim. Imagination, on the other hand, demands care. One aspect of this care, of course, is care for technique. Novelists spend months years refining their, their manuscripts. What is the best word for the situation, the mot juste? What is the best structure for this sentence, for this paragraph, for the story as a whole? All of these things occupy their time and their work, and it is tremendous work. But more importantly, novels demand care for the work itself. You cannot write a good novel without giving yourself to it completely. You must care about the story. You must care about the characters. You must care about what the story is trying to say. 
if you don't do these things, then you will not have a good novel. The most common criticism of fiction and also of the imagination more generally is that they are forms of escapism, attempts to flee from the troubles of the world by ignoring them. But in fact, imagination is the opposite of escapism. Imagination is not a running away from the world, but a running toward it. It is not apathy, but engagement. Imagining the world as it is not is always at least a comment on the world as it is. And it is often an attempt to change that or this world. Like any tool, the imagination may be used poorly or well, but however it is used, it is always a movement toward the world. Even the most gratuitously violent fiction and even the basest pornography are engaging the world. That is why they are dangerous. And that is why care is such an important quality that our imagination must have. This desire to engage society is what motivated the social reform novels of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the ones we were just talking about. Their goal was to depict the problems of society in order to encourage change. Many of them succeeded marvelously, and they are an inspiration to us today. But novels can do more than point out problems. They can also help find solutions. Doing so, however, often involves leaving realism and realistic novels behind and exploring the genres of fantasy and science fiction. In her 1985 novel, Always Coming Home, the science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin coined the term archeology span of the future to describe what she was doing. It expresses well the process by which a science fiction writer pieces together a vision of the future a vision of what might be. Listen to the way Le Guin describes it. I found at last the town I had been hunting for. After digging in several wrong places for over a year and persisting in several block-headed opinions, that it must be walled, with one gate, for instance, I was studying yet once more the contours of my map of the region when it dawned on me as slowly and as certainly as the sun itself that the town was there between the creeks, under my feet the entire time. And there was never a wall. What on earth did they need a wall for? What I had taken for the gate was the bridge across the meeting of the creeks and the sacred buildings and the dancing place, not in the center of town, for the center is the, it was the hinge, but over in their own arm of the double spiral, the right arm, of course, there in the pasture below the barn. And so it is, and so it is. Like archaeologists sifting through the remains of the past, science fiction writers find the might be in the flow of their imaginations. They begin with the realization that the mound over there isn't just a mound. Something lies beneath it. With great patience, with great care, they work their way into the mound, revealing what it truly is. The same can be said of authors of fantasy novels a genre that might be called the archeology span of the never was. Like the science fiction writers, they work with great care to figure out something that never existed. One of the most important aspects of writing either science fiction or fantasy is what novelists call world building. If you're telling a story that doesn't take place in a world like our own, you have to create that world for the reader. If you don't do it well, your readers won't be able to suspend disbelief and immerse themselves in the story, and the story will fail. We all recognize the signs of slipshod work in world building, a lack of consistency, a failure to think through the consequences of what has been imagined. For example, if in a science fiction story in the future, people travel between planets, but it's very expensive and slow, well, in that case, interplanetary trade can't be a significant motivation for exploration. It takes too long. So if the novelist claims that, that is true, we're not going to believe it. And once again, the story will fail. This leads us to our second necessary virtue when imagining things in a sophisticated way, thoroughness. Part of using the imagination well is using it thoroughly. 
What are the consequences of what we have imagined? How would a world built this way work? What would it look like on both the local scale and the global scale in the small ways and in the big ways? When imagining things, we cannot afford to be lazy. The third necessary virtue for sophisticated use of the imagination is far better known than the first two, and that is simply openness. There is no point in imagining anything if you're going to decide ahead of time what you will and won't accept as an outcome. Implicit in Le Guin's description of her archaeology is the feeling described by many writers that they don't really know what they're going to write until they write it. Openness, of course, is a well-established virtue of the imagination. It is the principle behind the practice of brainstorming, which is now so widespread. But being open is not enough. Openness alone does not lead to imagination, but to whimsy. Imagination is not the whim of the moment, but the sustained daydream made stronger by care and thoroughness. It is for this reason that all professional writers stress the importance of revision, more revision, and then more revision. Many novelists will tell you that the final version you see was the 10th, the 15th, or even the 20th revision of the work they're working on. We could expect, in this case, we could borrow a phrase from the poet Wordsworth. Imagination must learn to ply her craft by judgment steadied. So imagination cannot be simply whimsy, it must be more. A world other than our own, a might be or a never was, imagined thoroughly, carefully, and with an open mind is a powerful thing. The literary critic, Frederick Jameson, who borrowed Le Guin's term, archeology span of the future, for the title of one of his books, has written that fiction and fantasy can aid us at imagining and sometimes at realizing a system radically different from this one. The greatest virtue of these genres, he says, is precisely their ability to envision a world that is not our world, a way of life that is radically different from our own. As Jameson points out, the force of such a vision is not directed at the future, but at the present. The effect of imagining that which never yet has been is to open up the possibility of change here and now, to create a space in which the fut a future different from our present can be built. For Jameson, this quasi-destructive function, this questioning of what is, is a limit of what fiction can do. But I believe we can go further. You can no more destroy without creating than you can create without destroying. They are two sides of one coin. This is an old truth, but one that we have inadequately learned. We cannot create a space of possibility which is neutral, in which anything is possible. All spaces of possibility are biased. We create the possibility of certain things happening, not others. We make some things more possible than others and other things less possible. We make some things, uh, well, anyway, this is precisely why the content of what we imagine matters. If we imagine our ideal world as a consumerist paradise with new smartphones every year and a never ending stream of entertainment, have we considered the social and environmental consequences of unbridled consumerism? If we imagine our ideal world as one in which we and our property are totally secure, have we considered how that will be achieved through a police state or through a just and equitable society? If we are going to imagine solutions to the complex problems that face us, we must answer these kinds of questions. Because whatever we imagine will not merely destroy or create, it will do both. Learning to alter our imagination in a sophisticated and powerful way is, however, only the first and the easier of our two tasks. The second one is harder. How can we learn to imagine collectively, as a community, as a society, as a world? Because the problems facing us are problems facing all of us. And if we want to solve them, 
we have to learn to imagine together. This is an undiscovered country, which humans have only begun to explore. In answering this question, we have fewer examples to draw on, but we are not completely out to sea. The question of how we can reach agreement with an ever, in an ever smaller, ever more cosmopolitan world has been with us for a while now. And we do have some good examples to follow. Let's state our problem clearly. We need to imagine our future together, collectively. But we come from many countries, many cultures, many religions, and many different points of view. This is not a simple problem. A brief glance around the world today will show how frequently and how badly we have failed at working together. But we have not failed every time, nor have we failed completely. As we face the worst, the worst pandemic in a hundred years, it is worth remembering that events like this used to be far, far more common. More importantly, given the speed of modern travel, our airplanes, our high-speed trains, everything, and the interconnectedness of the world today, we should be facing pandemics on a regular basis. We have created a world in which they should thrive, in fact. The fact that we do not is proof of one of our successes as a species. We have learned to work together to control many of the worst diseases that afflict humans. Cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, malaria. These are the greatest killers in human history. While it is true that of these, only smallpox has been eliminated, and malaria alone continues to cause more than 400,000 deaths every year. Yet, we have made great progress in controlling them. Not so long ago, things were far, far worse. Malaria used to ravage cities like Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, to give you a simple example. We really have achieved something remarkable. How do we do it? How do we learn to bring these diseases under control? Well, at the risk of giving a very simple answer to a very complex question, I'm going to state it in two words, talking together. In every case where we have succeeded in working together internationally and overcoming difficult problems, our success has been based on coming together to discuss the problem with open minds and mutual respect. I'm gonna call this kind of discussion a consultation. Like imagining, consulting can be done well or badly. What are the virtues that enable good consultation? First, mutual respect. Public health workers state that maintaining a positive relationship with the community is the single most important part of their job. We cannot work together if we do not respect one another. We cannot consult meaningfully if we look down on any of our fellow participants. We must come together as one and truly see each other as equals. This, to be honest, is where we most frequently fail. It is very easy to consult when everyone there shares the same or at least a similar point of view. But it is precisely when we do not see eye to eye, when we have differences, that we most need to consult. If we enter the discussion convinced that the other participants are stupid, evil, untrustworthy, or completely in the wrong, there is no possibility of consultation. There is no possibility of creating a shared vision of the future. We see this failure every day, everywhere in the world, and we are living through its consequences. The second virtue necessary for consultation is open-mindedness. Now in a public health intervention, normally there's already a predetermined goal, but in consultation, that is not the case. In consultation, we cannot know the results beforehand. The goal of the process is to reach the results. As with imagination, consultation is pointless if we start by assuming we know where we're going to end up. This is another great challenge. When we consult, the only goal we can have is to find the best solution to our shared problems. Any other goal will derail the process. We must consult with an open mind and be willing to follow the discussion wherever it leads. 
The third virtue for consultation is selflessness. We have all witnessed the selfless sacrifices of health workers over the last half year. Well, consulting together requires that we all make a similar, reach a similar level of selflessness. When we consult, we give our ideas to the group and the group decides on whether to use them or not. The group accepts or rejects them. That acceptance or rejection has nothing to do with us. It does neither flatter nor insult our ego. We are part of the group and the group has only one goal, to arrive at the best possible conclusion. If the group does this, then it has succeeded and we should be happy to have been part of that success. It doesn't matter whose ideas were chosen in the end. We shouldn't even think that way. Mutual respect, open-mindedness, and selflessness. This is a very high standard, a standard that I admit is nowadays rarely achieved. In spite of that, it is what we must strive towards. Only through learning to consult together can we imagine a better future together, and we desperately need to imagine a better tomorrow. The world cannot continue the way it is. We have reached the moment in the, that in the structure of a story is called stasis equals death. All heroes reach this moment early in their story. They must learn, grow, and change or their story comes to an end. We, as the inhabitants of one world, must also learn together how to change or our story will be over as well. I believe with all my heart that we are capable of changing and that when we do so, we will embrace the great adventure that is the future of humanity. This challenge may sound overwhelming. It may seem that there is nothing we can do as individuals to help, but this is not the case. All that holds us back, all that is keeping us from making the changes we need to make is the belief that things cannot be different the belief that we cannot make a difference. Great changes begin with small ones. Yes, we need to think about how our world as a whole needs to change. But no, we're not gonna make these changes overnight. We can start with what is close at hand. Is there something in your world that you think needs to change? Imagine how you might make it better and then go out and do it. That's how all change begins. That, in fact, is how this lecture series came to be. Dr. Dungting Boyenton looked at the situation of the world, saw the pandemic, saw the hopelessness, saw the recrimination, the divisiveness, and she imagined what she could do to make things better. And then she went out and made it real. Each of us is capable of improving things in the world in our own unique way. In order to do so, all we need is the courage, the will, to imagine and the will to act on that imagination. We make the world and we can make it better. What world will we create? What world will we choose to live in? Friends, in these difficult days, I have often heard people quote Thomas Paine's famous words, these are the times that try men's souls. Usually when they say this, People simply mean that we are living in difficult times. This is undeniably true, but it is not what Paine meant when he wrote these words in the months leading up to the American Revolution. Rather, he meant that those were times in which a person's soul would be tested and tried and proven. What sort of soul was it? To what did it aspire? What does it value above all else? Paine felt that by their actions in that crucial time, individuals would judge themselves for better or for worse. We are living through a moment, similar moment of trial now, but we will not be judged as individuals. We will succeed or fail, soar or plummet as one human family. The day of judgment is upon us and we are the accused, the accuser, the judge and the jury. Our fate rests in the hands of no one but ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, the world as we have known it is ending. That end may come tomorrow or it may come decades from now, but it will come. Ends, however, are also beginnings. And the beginning of all things lies in our imagination 
and lives in our dreams. The time has come for us to dream a great dream, the greatest we've ever dared. We will succeed only if we dream boldly, wisely, and with compassion. We will only succeed if we dream together, a dream large enough to include the individuals of the, the in, to include the world and all its peoples. A dream of justice, a dream of unity, a dream of beauty, a dream of peace, a dream of hope. Thank you. All right. And these are the credit image credits for my talk. And this last slide is a very limited, but, uh, but nice list of suggested reading. Thank you again.